awesome. Have you ever considered the requirement that in, in order for us to be with Jesus in heaven forever, that we, re, we require God's righteousness? And the first thing that pops into my mind is, how can I attain God's righteousness in my imperfect self? Anybody perfect here? I'm going to put my hand down because I don't be no confusion. Right? I mean, none of us are perfect. We all have stuff. We all make mistakes. Things happen in all of our lives, either in the moments. So sometimes some things are happening that are really big in our lives that we're trying to get control of, a habit or a an addiction, or whatever the case may be. We're trying to, 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 to be more like Jesus. It takes time. This is the end of the message I want you to hear me say right now before we get into it. Your righteousness is not your righteousness. It's Jesus' righteousness in you. You are made righteous by Jesus and by Jesus alone. Does that make sense? So I want to encourage you that, to, to know that, 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 that your, your righteousness in Jesus is intact for eternity. Dodgers are ahead two games to none. That makes me happy. Go Dodgers. Your righteousness is intact for eternity because of what Jesus has done for you and I on the cross. Because of the empty grave. Because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Are you with me? All right. We're, we're going we're gonna to get to moving here. So, the problem becomes this. And I'm going to address this a little bit later in, in, in the talk. When we think about the, the, the things that Jesus has done for us on the cross, the, the, the abuse and the, and the pain and the suffering he put up with on the cross, and even the abuse and the pain he suffered before he even got to the cross when he's dealing with religious folk, when he's dealing with, 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 with sin in the world and, and, and disbelief, all the things that he did for us so that we can attain God's righteousness, our natural response is to try to work this out with our flesh. Well, because Jesus has done so much for me, I, I have to do so much for him to try to even this thing out. Well, you can't do it. You, you can't. My, my, my first response is, well, since Jesus has done this great thing, he's called me to do these things in, in my life, and therefore I'm going to start having to do these things to do things rather than being with him. We want to try to earn our way to God's good graces. Let me, are y'all tracking with me? It's, it's a natural response. I, 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 want to do, I want to do more because Jesus has done it all. And at some level, there's, there's, some, there's, some, there's some goodness about that idea. We want to serve Jesus. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But we cannot earn our salvation. We can't earn God's love by what we do. He's already did it on the cross. It is finished. That's what the Word says. So, so we have to learn to understand that, that, that um, God's righteousness does not come about by works. You can't do enough good things to tip the scales in your favor. I don't know how many times I've had this conversation with, with people. Are you going to heaven? Well, I don't know. Well, you don't, well tell me what that means. You, how, why, why don't, what, 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 what don't you know? You say, well, if, if the scales tip to my side, I'll be in. If the scale, if I don't do enough good things and to the others, I won't get in. It's not about scales. You understand that? You can't do enough works to make yourself good enough. There is no scale. There's only the cross. That's all there is. You don't need anything else. So we, we have to remember that we can't buy our way in. We can't win our way in. We can't impress others to get into heaven. We, we, we can't manipulate our way into salvation because Jesus has already purchased your freedom. And he offers it back to us as a gift. We have to open our hands up and receive. And as we receive, uh, great things will be happening for us in our lives. We become free, which is a beautiful thing. But you do have to do one thing. 
in order to receive this salvation, to receive this gift that God has given us. You ready to explore that idea with me? Yeah? Here we go. I just absolutely despise this thing. Thank you. The Bible says this. Paul wrote this to the Romans that if, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Very familiar passage for most of us, right? It's a passage we've heard a lot of. It's, it's a great passage. Um, the things that we see in this passage that, that I feel like that I want to talk about today is, is what's plainly evident in the text is not necessarily plainly evident in my life. What's plainly evident in the text may not be plainly evident in, in your life. Are you with me? So we're going to talk about that. Number one, if you're a note taker, we do not gain God's righteousness by works. The Bible says right here that we gain God's righteousness by confessing and believing in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That's what it says. We, we gain righteousness by confession and by believing. So what is this confession idea about? It's pretty interesting. Some of the first things that pops into my mind, and I've never been Catholic, is the idea of confessing uh, confessing uh, in the confessional. You go into the box and, and you close the door and the curtain goes, I've seen it on TV, the curtain goes, and the priest goes, um, how can I serve you today, brother? And you say, well, I did this sin, did that sin, did such sins. And that you confess your sins to the priest. That's not really a biblical idea, but it is a biblical idea for us to confess our sins one to another. But it's not the kind of confession that this is talking about. It's a different kind of confession. Like a confession, it's a confession that's built around the idea of, uh, of, of being in agreement with Jesus. When we confess the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we are in agreement with what God said about Jesus and with that what Jesus said about himself. All the I am that Jesus said we are in agreement with. All of, all of the that, that, that he is my son and I'm well pleased. We are in agreement with all the things that God has said about himself and all the things that Jesus has said about himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. We're in agreement with that. That's, that's part of our confession. And that's, this is where the creeds come in. And we're not really creedal people in Foursquare. I like the creeds in my own life because it helps keep me centered and my mind centered on the things that are of God. The, the, the Jesus is the Son of God, born of a virgin, etc., etc., etc. We're in agreement that all those things are true that's in the Bible. And it also means that we recognize that Jesus is God. We recognize that Jesus is God, that, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior of the world, that he is the deliverer of his people, and, and, and that his work on the cross is the only way of salvation for mankind. Receiving the work that Jesus did on the cross is the only way of salvation for mankind. Let me unpack that just a little bit. Jesus, the perfect man Jesus, the sinless Jesus, the one who committed no sin ever, because he's always been, he's eternal, hung on the cross in my place. He took my place. He took your place. Because of your sin, the Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death. Jesus died in my place. He didn't die for his own sins. He died for the sins of the world. That's the work of the cross. That's what the cross is for. He died in your place and in my place. Um, I think it's a it's what it's about what Jesus has has done. And confession has the idea of being in agreement with, with God, of who Jesus is. It also has the idea of speaking, of using our vocal cords to confess. Confession means to declare openly by way of speaking out freely. Such a confession brings the deep effect, uh, brings uh, being the effect of deep conviction of facts. Look, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, if you confess your, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's a real thing. That, that, that that's a confession that we should that we that we need to make 
I mean, for me, daily. Let me remind myself that Jesus is Lord. And, and when I call, well, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but it means something when we call him Lord. It's not a religious position in the church. It's not a, it's not a, a standard bearer for a, a particular worldview or an idea. He is Lord over all. Over all. We need to recognize that and confess that, confess that to other people. But Jesus is my, I serve Jesus. I, I, Jesus is, is, is my, my king. He's, he's, he's not only my savior, but I, I follow him because he's leading me. That needs to be our confession. But we don't say that just with words, do we? We also say that with the way that we love other people. Back up real quick. I want you to, I want you to hear me say, we show that Jesus is Lord of our lives by what we do. I'm not invoking works into that idea. I love Jesus, therefore I work really, really hard because I want to prove my love for him. It's the way that we love one another. It's how we show Jesus is Lord. It's the way that we love our enemies. It's how we show Jesus is Lord. It's the way that we love our neighbors. Is the way that we show how Jesus is Lord of our lives. You may have heard people say, I don't understand you. The, the, your boss is treating you like, like whatever, and you're just being compliant and not disobedient. You're just loving and kind. How do you do that, Jesus? That's a confession. It's a confession. It needs to be the confession outside of this building, not in, in, in your life and in the world of places that you go. So confession has the idea of speaking. Uh, and then it goes, it says, if, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. So, so believing is to have a faith directed unto. I, I, I believe or in faith that, that gives, uh, I give myself up to that belief. The things that I believe makes a difference in my life. The things that I believe makes a difference in the way that I, that I love. That comes out of belief. Listen, believing is not mental ascension to an idea. That's not believing. Maybe understanding. The believing that we're talking about here is, is, is the level of belief, of faith that will change the environment that I'm in. It's not just a mental ascension to that Jesus is. and It's not that. It's, it's transformational. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. So it's, it's, it's confession and it's believing. So by believing and by confessing, it boils down that, we, it, that you and I need to be in the practice of sharing our story. We've been talking about that for the last three weeks. Last week, we talked about that, that we need the written word, the logos, as our foundation, but we also need the spoken word for direction. That rhema word. Can you can I just encourage you that the rhema word coming out of your mouth can change the life of somebody else? The rhema word coming out of your mouth can redirect the life for the kingdom of God just by your by your spoken word, by your obediently spoken word. Does that make sense? There is no private faith. Well, me and little Jesus, we like this thing worked out, and we're cool, and but it's cool, and we're all cool. Great. Meanwhile, your neighbor is suffering or struggling or needs, a, needs an encouraging word from the Lord or needs to know about the love of God. That's a rainbow word that you have for your community. That's your confession. Does that make sense? Are you with me? I, I, I love that idea of, of, let me show you how much I love Jesus by what I do. Let me... I, much rather, let me show you how I love Jesus by the way I love you. And, the way, and you do the same back to me by the way that you love me. That's Jesus. That's, that's the Holy Spirit in action is through love. 1 Corinthians 13 supports that pretty strongly, I do believe. Let's keep moving. So confession is sharing your story. And, and number two, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus... It is, is, is part of this process as well. We can never forget all that it meant to say that Jesus Christ is Lord. The, the, the Greek word used there is the word kyrios. Kyrios. And if, if a man 
it, but before Jesus came, the word kurios in the Greek was only attributed to the, 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 uh, the, 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 the emperor of, of Rome, the Roman emperor. Now, but when Jesus came, people who were not Christians, who were Jews or Roman citizens, began to attach the word kurios to Jesus. And can I just tell you something, if you know this is true, if you're a Roman citizen and you attach the lordship of your life to somebody other than the emperor, you got problems. You know that, right? I mean, they did that at the behest of their own death or suffering or persecution because I'm not calling you Caesar Lord anymore. I respect you, but I give my life to Jesus. Kyrios. He's my Lord. Well, how many of you know if a Jew to con be converted to Christianity and walking away from everything that he's been taught as what a Jew, how a Jew lives and talks and walks and call Jesus Kyrios? I'm following him now. I'm not following the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I'm following Jesus. I've been converted. I've been transformed. Let me tell you what. A Jew would never use the word kurios unless transformation has occurred, ever. For the same reason as persecution. You cast out of the synagogue. You can't work. You can't eat. You can't take care of your family. But you're, but you're, but you're announcing, you're professing, you're confessing that Jesus is kurios in my life. That really is the idea of transformation, isn't it? I mean, there's a time in our lives as we go through our lives and the struggles and the, and, and the things and all the stuff when we're not calling Jesus Lord. But there comes that time when we cross over not only that line of faith, but that regenerational, that, that transformational point in our own history where we've said, I'm walking away from the world. I'm beginning to follow Jesus. He is my curiosity. He's my Lord. He's, he, he, he's my Lord. We want to unpack a little more what the Lord means here in just, just a moment. But th that transformation is not a mental ascent. It is a shift. It's a big shift in our lives. You remember before that you were saved and then you were filled with the Holy Spirit shift. That that's when Jesus became curious to you. Can that back with the sharing? That's good. That's really good. My friend Sid said that he had a word, and the word was, you can have the knowledge of Christ, but it doesn't have any power until you share it. When you share it, when you confess that word, it gains power. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I'm with you on that. I like that. It's pretty good thinking. That's, we want to get there. It's a good word, though. <laughs> so confess with your mouth that... That Jesus is Lord and it becomes transformational. You understand the difference between transformation and confirmation, right? The Bible says, don't be, con don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. Being conformed to the world is we take the shape of the things in the world. We take the shape of them. Imagine, imagine a, um, uh, a, 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 a cookie cutter. You all used cookie cutters before? Yeah, my, 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 my favorite kind of cookie cutter is, is Spongebob because it's already square and it's ready to go. I just made that up. It's not really Spongebob. I don't have a favorite cookie cutter. But, but in order to conform a cookie to look like a particular shape, you take the, 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 the cookie cutter and you press it down over an unshaped, a kind of a mass of dough. It's dough, right? And you shape it to the shape that you want it in, a pumpkin or a Christmas tree or a, 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 a gingerbread man or, or whatever, whatever it is you're making. And that dough becomes what you've made it by conforming to the inside. That's, that's conflict, being conformed to the world. How many of you can think of places in your life or in your history where you lived a life that was conformed to the world? I did. I mean, you've heard most of my list, and it's not, not, a, not a good one. Pretty complete, though. It's a pretty long list. When I was conformed to the world. I was doing what the world expected me to do, what the world expected me to be. How the world expected me to live. I, 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 I was, I, that was my Lord. That's what I was conformed to. But transformation is being conformed from the inside out, not the outside in. Trans, we're transformed by the filling of the Holy Spirit. We're transformed by, by a new heart, by a new mind, by a new life that we're given. When we step over that line of faith and begin to follow Jesus, we're transformed to new life. 
It comes from the inside out. The pressure for me to behave in a way that honors God comes from the inside out, not the outside in. You see the difference between conforming and transforming? The Bible says that you and I must be transformed. Now, 100% transformation this side of heaven, not going to happen. Can't do it. The Bible teaches that pretty plainly. But on the, when we get to heaven, we'll see clearly, right? All the, 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 the veil will be removed and we'll understand more deeply. However, you and I live every day with the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. And we're making a decision. We're making a choice. We're, we're walking a particular way. And the Holy Spirit will say, what are you doing? That's what he says to me. Hold them up. Because my Holy Spirit's from the south. He says, hold them up. Where are you going? What are you doing? You're fixing to step in it, son. You need to stop. You need to redirect. You need to, 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 to change your direction. You need to repent. You with me? We all experience that on the small levels and great big levels as well. That's transformation that takes from the inside out. And it's always pushing up against confirmation of the world. The world says, do this, do that. We can do this. This is okay. This is not okay. This is what, we have freedom in Christ, amen? But we can be transformed from the inside out because of the love of God that's in us. Right? Okay. That was a rant. So, here we are. So, it says that 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 uh, we must believe, and that and that leads to there it is. We must also believe this: that that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, but we also must believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. You would be surprised how many people who would say that they are Christians has a problem with that idea. It's counterintuitive. When you're dead, you're dead. Right? That's been our experience in, our, in, in, in the world. We see that every single day. When you're dead, you're dead. But the Bible teaches that Jesus overcame death. He was victorious over death. He was resurrected from the dead. Can I just say this? I just want to say this. You can wonder about the resurrection. I think that's okay. You can wonder, how could this be? What happened? I don't get it, but I think it is a non-negotiable that as believers, as followers of Jesus, we must, we must believe in the resurrection, that he was dead, now he's alive, he's right the right hand of the Father. I don't think that's negotiable to, to my mind. I don't have to understand it. I can even have times of, of doubt, but ultimately I need to come back to belief and faith in that. That is, that's, that is transitional. That is foundational to who Jesus is. Because if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, that makes him a liar. And lying is a sin. Jesus didn't sin. Therefore, he didn't lie. You understand what I'm saying? This is foundational. You could even struggle with the idea. But ultimately, you have to fall down on faith and just say, yes, this is what happened. So, so we have to believe that, that God raised Jesus from the dead. And it, it, it's not that we believe the resurrection as opposed to the cross. It's either the cross or the resurrection. Which one do you believe? I think Paul, Paul is bringing this idea together. And the fact that he, even, he didn't even mention um, the cross itself. It, it, the idea of, of the crucifixion for, for sin and the resurrection to new life is all part of the, of the same idea. And as we believe that inside of our heart, uh, we have to understand belief is, is not enough without accompanying action, we must confess that belief with our mouth. So, I want to just, I don't want to spend too much time on this, so the Lord, I think, just wants me to speak on this just a little further. Mental ascent, historical understanding of who Jesus is does not make you a Christian. Understanding that Jesus was even born of a virgin, understanding in your mind that he was born in Bethlehem and that he lived through three years a sinless life and that he was crucified for the sins of the world and he was resurrected from the dead. Those are historical facts that can be proven outside of the Bible. Even the devil knows that. Are you with me? A mental ascent is not being born again. 
Having a new idea or a new thought towards Jesus is not being born again. Being born again is being transformed to new life and by humbly following Jesus as Lord. There's a difference. There's a difference between an aha moment. I never had that thought about Jesus. And then when we transform, that thought becomes, oh, Lord God, you're, you are my deliverer. You're my deliverer. I'm going to follow you with everything that I am. Not mental ascension. It's, it's submission. It's, 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 it's bowing to the lordship of Jesus. To the, to, it's bowing to the lordship of Jesus. The Bible teaches that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. That's what he said right there. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that what? Jesus is Lord. Jesus, Jesus is Karios. He's my Karios. He's my king. And I'm going to follow every tongue. The demons, lost people, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It's not mental ascension. It's, it's complete submission. The problem becomes this. Is that just seems... Too simple. If I just believe in my heart and confess with my tongue that Jesus is Lord, I am delivered. That's what the Bible says, right? Doesn't that seem really simple? That seems, that seems so, so simple to attain the high grace that we receive in the promises of God. It seems, see, that this becomes the problem because our flesh wants to respond. Well, for me to achieve this high thing, I must do a lot. I must, I must, I must be all of the. I must, I must do all of these things in order to achieve this high goal. When we have, and we forget that the high goal was achieved for us on the cross. The high goal was achieved for us when we said yes and stepped across that line of faith and began to live our lives to please Jesus and Jesus alone. That, that's all that we, we confess and we believe, and that's it. There's nothing more required of you. You don't have to fill out a card. You don't have to make any promises. You don't have to do anything other than confess and believe. That's it. It seems so simple. And it is, really, when you think about it. But then so many of us struggle with that. So many people in the kingdom of God struggle with that. I was, I was walking down the street the other day. I was talking to a Lutheran pastor. I didn't know the guy. I didn't know him anybody. Fine guy. He had great reputation. I knew about reputation. And uh, I told him who I was. I was there as a chaplain, but I told him I, I, I pastor a church in Manasha. Oh, and he, he did this. Oh, oh in Manasha. Uh, what, what, what church? Trying to be nice. Didn't really feel like he cared that much, to be honest. And I told him, and old boy literally turned his face like this and walked the other direction, not saying a word. Not saying a word. I was, I didn't, I wasn't really offended because I didn't really understand the depth of his actions until I was contemplating. Lord, what was that all about? I'm just trying to make a friend, you know, I'm trying to hang out with a brother. And uh, uh, that, that's that's that idea. Well, you're this this type of person. You're this type of believer. We just don't associate with you kind of people. That's what they said to Jesus too. We just don't associate with you kind of people. So I'm good with that, right? But. It's 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 about confession. It's about believing and uh, allowing that life changing belief to to, to 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 change your life. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's it's it is simple, but because Jesus paid the price for us. Look, this idea about mental ascension is important. James wrote this. Not this one. I did miss one. We did that pretty good. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Then James said this. There it is. You believe that there is one God. James is talking to the Christians, to the first century Christians. You believe that there is one God. You do well because there is only one God. He said, you do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble. Many people believe that Jesus was a real historical person and that they believe he was a genuinely good guy. But the Bible says that even the demons believe there's only one God. But believing 
is not enough. You must confess and believe. Confess and believe. And there's a, our favorite, one of our favorite examples of, of, of how powerful a belief, a faith, and confession is, is found in the crucifixion story of Jesus. Let's just look at that. So, so then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. I want to go back and kind of backtrack this story just a little bit, if you don't mind, because I think context is really is going to unpack the power in this in this particular application. I'm looking at uh, uh, Luke chapter 23, and I'm going to back up to verse 32. Luke 23, verse 32. You guys are, are really familiar with these passages, but you want to read along. That's great. Luke 23, verse 32. There were also two other criminals, two others, comma, criminals led with him, Jesus, to be put to death. You've seen, you've seen the picture. Jesus in the middle and the thieves on either side. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, where they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right, other on the left. Verse 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. These two thieves on the cross witnessed Jesus forgiving the ones who killed him, who were going to kill him. And Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for whatever. that was a confession. The, 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 the lost people, the thieves, saw that confession in Jesus. And uh, well, let's see what happens with the rest of their story. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments, and they cast lots. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them, with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you, are, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. In verse 39. And one of the criminals who were, who were hanged blasphemed Jesus, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked the other, the other thief, saying, Do you not even fear God? He had witnessed all the things that Jesus had done. He had witnessed them, the, the forgiveness and the love for the others who were causing his hate. For Jesus' enemies, he forgave them. And as he sneered upon it, he didn't answer, he didn't retaliate, he didn't, he didn't do anything. And, and I, I, it, it's an amazing idea to me that this, that this relatively, this two or three hour time window where the, the thieves were with Jesus, they saw Jesus continue to be Jesus, even while he's hanging on the cross, even with nails through his wrist and through his feet and the crown of thorns on his head. He was probably not wearing any clothes whatsoever. He has been scourged and he had been and, and, he was a he, he was brutally brutally murdered. Are you with me? And even in the midst of all that, Jesus said, "Forgive them, for they don't know what they do." And one of the criminals says, "If you are the Christ, save yourself and us." Isn't that an interesting statement. Who's the thief concerned about? Himself. Himself. That's confirmation, being conformed, not transforming, transformation. But the other answer rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God? He recognized Jesus as God. That was the Holy Spirit who did that. There's no, there's no other way, I don't think. Seeing that you are under the same condemnation of death, and we, you and I, we justly deserve it, for we receive the due reward, click. There we go. 
And we, we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. We're guilty of what we're being punished for. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then this thief said to Jesus, he said, Lord. He said, Lord. He didn't say, if you are Lord. He said, he called him Lord. He, he, he confessed with his mouth. And he believed that Jesus is Lord. He said, Karios, Lord. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And look at Jesus' response. Jesus' response is, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The second thief on the cross, the second criminal being crucified with Jesus, the one who previously had mocked Jesus with the soldiers and the ones... And the leaders who sneered. He was part of that whole, that whole crowd, that whole crowd that, that just was 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 just uh, brutal towards Jesus because they didn't believe. Though at first they both mocked Jesus in the hours spent on the cross, one of the criminals came to see things differently. And he actually put his trust in Jesus. He recognized where he was at, but he also recognized who he was with. And uh, he gave his heart, he gave his life to Jesus, as short as it was going to be. The, the, the second thief, he knew his own sin. He understood the problem, the sin problem that he had, because he was under the same condemnation. He said, we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. I'm getting what I deserve. This man does not deserve anything. And then he, he knew Jesus. And when he said that, he said, this man has done nothing wrong. And, and, and the interesting thing is, how did he know that? Is it possible that the, that the, the second thief, or maybe both of the thieves, were, had, had heard Jesus speak before? It's reasonable. But what's more reasonable, while they were standing in line, waiting for their turn at crucifixion, at, at paying the penalty for their prices, they saw with their eyes and they heard with the ears the interaction he had with Pilate. And Pilate said to the crowd, he has done nothing wrong to the crowd. He's done nothing wrong. What do you want me to do with them? Crucify him. Crucify him. Who do you want in this place? Barabbas. You know the story. They saw that. They witnessed that. And Jesus' response to that was continuing to be loving and, 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 and just... And, Doing the thing that God has called for him to do. He called out to Jesus. He confessed to Jesus. He said to Jesus, he said, Lord, uh, he called him Lord. He, he called him Lord. When, when we call Jesus Lord, can, I just, we need to get a hold of this. There are some people in the world or in the church even who has this idea when we call Jesus Lord, we're identifying his official position in the church. Like Jesus is walking around with a little official vest on, like the greeters at Walmart, those cool little vests, and they got this, my name is Robert. And you say, hi, Robert. I'm not really Robert. I just used his vest. My name is Bob. You know, I'm so gone or whatever. I mean, it's just an identification, and, and, and his official capacity is Lord. He is Lord. And we identify him as, as, as being the head of the church, but not the head of me. When you walk into the Walmart and you see the greeter, you don't have to say hi. It doesn't make him any less the greeter, but you ain't been greeted properly. You with me? Does that make sense? We see, we see Jesus as his, as his figurehead, as, 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 as anything but Lord, but it's just a, a place of power. I mean, he has a place of power, but the idea is this. You and I need to see him as Lord. And we need to call him Lord. And we need to understand when we cry out to him and we call him Lord, we are saying, I submit my life to you. All that I am, all that I have, everything that I will be, I dedicate it to you in service of your kingdom. Because you are my Lord. You see the difference? Jesus has called us. Jesus has a plan for my life and for your life. And when we call him Lord, we're saying, not my way, but your way. 
Not, not the things that bring me pleasure. I want to die to myself. I want to please you, Jesus. I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant from you. I want to follow you. I want to be like you. You see the difference? If Jesus is king, that means you are his servant. That means you are his, 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 uh, uh, he's leading you. That's the better way to put it. He's leading you. And like any other leader you have in your life, more so with Jesus, our, our humility responds in love. That's simple. It's not simple. Is it simple? No. It's not simple at all. But we need to understand that, 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 that if, we, if we call Jesus Lord, it has to be like this. If we call Jesus Lord, it's bound to his authority and his sovereignty over me. If we call Jesus the Lord, he has authority. If you're here on Wednesday night, we talked about that in the men's Bible study. He has authority by the fact that he created you. This is my response. Yes, Lord, speak. Here I am, send me. Yes, Lord, I understand what I did. And I confess, I repent, and I'm joining, I'm, I'm following you. Thank, forgive me. That's Jesus as Lord. I, I, I love my, 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 my liturgical friends. They have pictures in the, in the sanctuary of Jesus. Big, huge pictures in the, in the heart. and it is, They're beautiful. I love them very, very much. But acknowledging G Jesus as I call him in the church is not the same as calling him Lord. Make sense? We need to follow Jesus. Follow, follow Jesus. He is, we, he called Jesus Lord, and when he called Jesus Lord, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, and he believed the promise of everlasting life from Jesus. So minutes before their death, two criminals hung next to Jesus on the cross. One of the criminals mocked him, the other one confessed and believed. Jesus told the one who confessed and believed, who trusted him, that he would soon be in heaven. Can you imagine this idea? I just thought, I was praying about this early this morning, that Jesus was on the cross minutes, hours, minutes, moments before his death. You understand when people died on the cross, they died of asphyxiation. They, 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 they literally choked to death because they can't breathe. Their body is so weak from, from being pulling stuff on the cross that it compresses their diaphragm and is no longer able to work. They can't breathe. So I imagine the words when Jesus told me, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. Those words were racked with pain. I imagine those words were, were hard for him to get out. But he wanted them to know. Because you believe and you confess, you're going to be with me. That was the last thing that he said to, to, to other people. And he spoke to the Father after that. Are you with me? I just can't imagine the last thing. Just, I tell you the truth. Verily, verily, I say unto you today, you'll be with me in paradise. <sighs> and then no more breath. And the breath. You understand what it was? A, it was a big deal. It was difficult for Jesus to do, but he did it because, it, because he wanted to encourage them. But he also was confessing himself to the ones who were watching. There was a crowd that gathered around. Jesus told the one who trusted in him that he would soon be in heaven in paradise with me. He received grace. He received the gift of grace. The thief, the thief on the cross had 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 some distant time in, re in remembering and talking to Jesus. He said, he said, so uh, Jesus, just, just remember me when you get to, when, when you get to, when you come into your kingdom. He had some far off idea. He had, listen, he had some far off idea. Sometimes you and I have a far off idea of what heaven is. Heaven's a thing when I die. Heaven's a thing when I stand before the then. Let, let me tell you, heaven is today. Heaven is now. Heaven, heaven is now. And, and Jesus told the thief on the cross, I tell you the truth, you'll be with me today. He overcame his own expectation. The expectation was, whenever you get to me, Jesus, 
Just remember me. That's all that I ask. Well, I got something better for you. You're going to be with me today in paradise. He overcame an expectation. Guess what Jesus does the best? He overcomes expectations of ourselves and everything else around us. So when the thief sat on the cross, he had this distant time in mind. And secondly, the thief on the cross, he asked only to be remembered. Jesus, just think of me. That's all I ask. Just remember me when you get to your kingdom. Jesus says, no, I've got something better for you. You're going to be with me in the kingdom with me today. I'm not just going to remember you. I'm going to be with you. He, he exceeded an expectation. I just no, I'm, You're going to be with me. You only want this. I got that. You only want li I got abundance for you. That's what I got. And it's the same thing for you and I. Jesus, just remember me when I die. In the sweet by and by, and that would be good enough. He said, no, I got abundant life for you today. Right now, be with me. And thirdly, the, the thief on the cross had this expectation to, they looked only for a kingdom. He said, Jesus, when you get to your, to your kingdom, remember me. Jesus said, today, you'll be with me, not in, only in my kingdom, but in paradise. Exceeded expectations. I only want to be part of your kingdom. I'll be a serf. I'll be one of those guys that clean up after the horses. That's good enough for me. He said, no, you're going to be with me, and your life is going to be paradise. Same thing for us. We don't have to settle for less. We don't have to settle for anything. The Lord Jesus, the creator of all that loves me, that died on the cross for me and resurrected from the dead so that I can have victory over death, we have it all. We should be settling for nothing. Nothing. Jesus, Jesus, he, he did it all for us. So, so the thief was experienced in paradise because he confessed and because he believed. This is the problem. We've all sinned. Everybody. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And what that means is that God has asked, demands, holiness, righteousness for us to be with him. You understand that? that that's what God, that the level of of hanging out with God is righteousness, is his righteousness. If you want to become, be part of my court, you got to be perfect like me. But it wasn't going to happen. So he sent a son to die for us on the cross so we can have his righteousness through the death of Jesus that we receive by faith. That righteousness is what allows us to be in the presence of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's because of that righteousness that, that, that's, that, that's, that, we, that has been imparted, impugned upon us because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We all need grace. Everyone say, I need grace. You need grace. We all need grace. But the problem, church, is hear me say this. We all have not received grace. We all need grace. And we know that we need grace. But we haven't succumbed to the lordship of Jesus to receive his grace. So, are you trying to be good enough for God to gain his righteousness? Marita, if you and Tanya want to come. Are you trying to be good enough for God to gain his righteousness? The bad news is this. You can't. You can't do enough good to earn your way into heaven. You can't do it. You can't do enough good to please your father. You can't do it. You can't ever you can't ever be good enough on your own strength, on your own power generated from the flesh. You can't do it. But the good news is this is Jesus has made a way. Jesus has made a way for you to experience his righteousness and your forever abundant life in him in the father that it starts can start even now. That's the good news. But you can't simply just know that Jesus was this guy born in Bethlehem and yeah, and he made all the, everybody mad and they killed him and they say he resurrected from the dead. I don't know. You can't just have a mental assent to this historical truism, this fact. You have to confess and believe. Simply knowing that he died on the cross in my place and that he conquered death and resurrection. You have to believe in that and confess that with your mouth that the Lord Jesus and, and believe in your heart 
that God has raised him from the dead, and then you will be saved. This is my question to you. Do you believe? Do you believe past the mental ascension? Do, do, do you believe to the space where you can do this? Yes, Jesus, you're Lord of my life. Here I am. Send me. Yes, Jesus, I confess you to be my Lord. I want the world to know that you're my Lord. Is your belief ascended that to where your confession be that Jesus is Lord, is my Lord? If it hasn't, then today's your day. Today you make that confession. I repent of what, how I used to believe and think. And I want more of your abundant life in me. I want more. I, I, I want to be your servant. I want you to be my Lord. You don't have to come perfect. You don't have to get yourself right before you get with Jesus. You don't have to do anything other than confess and believe. That's it. Or, or maybe, maybe, maybe you've been a believer for a long time and, you, and you've let your spiritual life kind of slip to the left or to the right. When you're trying to work things out in your flesh, trying to understand this, this, this kingdom living outside of the kingdom. Today's the day you need to repent. So Lord, forgive me for trying to do this on my own. Forgive me for trying to do this in my flesh. I call you Lord. Here I am. Send me. Or maybe you just need to worship and just to praise him for who he is. Maybe you just need to just spend some time fellowshipping with Jesus and the Holy Spirit through song and through, through, through meditations. And Maybe you need to just, just, just worship him this, this, this morning. And now's the time for you to do that. So there's something for every single one of us in here to do. Amen? Amen. Whatever it is the Lord is calling you to do right now, can I just, please, can I just say, your obedience starts right now, this moment. Don't, that's fine, go ahead. Don't, don't say I'll do it later. I, I need to get, I need to make some changes. I need to do this. You don't need to do anything but be obedient to what the Holy Spirit is telling you. That, that's beautiful. You can sure do that. You're fine. You're fantastic. So whatever the Lord is moving upon you this moment, let's all stand together and let's worship him and, and, and respond to him in obedience. Amen.